Hey, I'm Strummer Dude or Mad or whatever. I don't know. So early on in developing his search engine thriller Her Story, developer Sam Barlow tested his simple mechanic by using video files from an actual criminal case. While it proved the gameplay could be engaging, but also hinted at the phenomenon at the heart of the story. Her story's main character, Hannah, is obsessed with fairy tales, but it's important to note how she reads the stories. At the front of the book was an index of illustrations. We read that more than the actual stories. We'd read aloud the captions and fit between the pictures. Conjuring up the details of a story solely from a few pictures likely refers to the media frenzy surrounding Amanda Knox, an American woman initially convicted of killing her flatmate by an Italian court despite the lack of physical evidence. Barlow took inspiration from the way the Italian police determined guilt from behavior alone, while Europeans scrutinized every picture of her, often defaulting to film noir tropes like the femme fatale. What's interesting, then, is that her story openly invites such tropes. The story begins in a fairly conventional place. By searching the word murder, we learn a woman's husband has been killed, and a few days later, she's being arrested. Immediately, we have the skeleton of a caricature, the femme fatale. From there, we slowly piece together the story from hundreds of short clips, eventually learning Hannah has a secret twin named Eve, who has been switching places with her during the interrogation. We're adding meat to the bones, as it were. The gameplay loop is even met metaphorically referenced during the game. It must have been taken up to the attic in parts and then reassembled up there. In the same clip describing the dollhouse and how she used to conjure up stories for its plastic inhabitants, she mentions a significant outside work. They ended up crushing it under a copy of the Arabian Nights. Originally known as 1001 Nights and dating as far back as the 9th century, The Arabian Nights is an 18th century collection of Middle Eastern folk tales translated to English. The overarching narrative revolves around a king who executes his brides the morning after their nuptials. The book's narrated by the king's newest wife, who delays her execution by telling short to unfinished stories, often spinning new tales from ones previously told. We can make parallels with her story's own narrative framing and gameplay loop, searching keywords to find new story threads. And all these stories we've been telling each other, just that, stories. The murder mystery, and by extension her story, owes much to the Arabian night story The Three Apples. The whodunit popularized three significant elements of the genre. Unreliable narrators, like Hannah, whose lying forces us to constantly separate truth from fiction. An early version of the foreshadowing technique Chekhov's Gun, in which every element of a story holds significance later. A crucial component of her story, in that keywords lead to new video clips of further extrapolation. And the idea of self-fulfilling prophecies, like Hannah's aspirations of living a fairy tale, when in reality, life sucks and then you slit your husband's throat. Her story also heavily uses a technique from Arabian Nights called thematic patterning, uniting disparate story threads under repeated motifs and themes. In this case, her story constantly plays with the idea of dualities and fairy tale conventions. Barlow uses the former extensively to hint at Hannah and Eve's fractured identities and troubled sisterhood. More inborn than external hints like their black and white cat named Domino and the Mirror Game, even Hannah's names are both palindromes. It reads the same backwards as forwards. But as noted by Hannah, It doesn't work from there, it's not quite symmetrical, but well, you get the idea. Acknowledging the slight differences between a set of identical twins who try to desperately to perfectly mimic each other. We see this schism in fairly minute details. Eve prefers her coffee black, Hannah keeps her hair up, but Eve's more outgoing personality, which comes through during interrogations, splinters them. She was always more popular with the boys, and I used to hate her for it. Hmm. I really hate her sometimes. As with any relationship, sex complicates things. Eve being more flirtatious, she seduced boys for the both of them. Until Simon. She then felt betrayed when Hannah broke their established rules and slept with him. Of course, Hannah becomes pregnant and the two hastily marry and move into Simon's parents' place, leaving Eve behind. Though trying to become her own person with a tattoo, I got it to express my individuality. Eve soon pines to again reflect Hannah, screwing anything that moves in hopes of becoming pregnant. Shortly following that failed plan, Hannah's parents die under mysterious circumstances, accidentally poisoning themselves and consequently allowing Hannah to move back into her parents' place with Simon. In the same year, Hannah suffers a miscarriage, and Eve almost revels in the news. But like the universe had corrected its course, we were aligned again. 
Such a heavy emphasis on duality coalesces into the other major motif, likening life to fairy tales, which further invite film noir tropes. As Eve says, So you see, even before I knew the truth, I'd found it in the stories. The two conjure up their own Once Upon a Times, looking towards Rapunzel, Snow White, and even Princess Diana as inspirations for their fantasies. Of course, tragedy befell the latter, shattering a bit of the fairy tale mystique. Life isn't a fairy tale. Still, it didn't stop Hannah from seeing Simon as her prince, one who gives her a unique, hazy mirror for her birthday, something to show who was the fairest of them all. It's the perfect mirror for someone who doesn't like to take a brain reflection. Hannah and Eve feel like spin-offs of the character Norman Desmond in the classic noir film Sunset Boulevard, females intoxicated by fantasy only to lose themselves in their own imaginations. When the film's lead breaks Desmond's fantasy that the aging actress will never work in Hollywood again, Desmond plugs him full of bullets and embraces the subsequent media circus. While performing at a bar, Eve accidentally attracts the gaze of Simon. Unbeknownst to Hannah, Eve sleeps with Simon and, surprise, gets impregnated by his, um... This fucking magic spell. Right, his... Right. Believing a disguised Hannah is Eve, Simon makes the fatal mistake of gifting her another hazy mirror. That unique present. With her happily ever after soured, Hannah loses it and accidentally slashes his throat open with the mirror. Note that Simon wasn't wearing his glasses. He's not got his glasses on here though. He takes them off from the camera. But he needs them to see properly, you know. He has to read a newspaper or a menu in a restaurant. Not books so much, but watching TV. He likes TV. In a sense, he couldn't see Hannah as her own individual person, indulging his own fantasy and seeing her perfect half instead. Ironically, Simon wanted to get caught cheating to prove Hannah and Eve were different people, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. In getting arrested, Eve finally becomes her own person, technically not existing in society up to this point. I haven't put down any roots. I don't exist. She can finally tell her story in her own words. However, we still assume the role of an armchair detective. We're acting as if googling the case details of Amanda Knox or doing research about the serial podcast, or trying to piece the puzzle together. Even outside the game, many sites still debate the ending, and many videos theorize whether Eve was an actual twin, or if Hannah suffered from dissociative identity disorder, or if she was just lying. Every detail, no matter how small, is scrutinized. As we learn more about this woman, we catch a reflection of ourselves in the hazy monitor. Like Simon's tarnished silver mirror, the dirty monitor could signal our flimsy understanding of Eve's story. Eve similarly relied on weak research to learn about her roots. It's hard to know if this is all true. These are stories I remember that I read when I was a child. Maybe I misread. Maybe I misunderstood. This, of course, can be seen as a bit of foreshadowing given the player's true identity. After learning the major revelations of the story, Sam Barlow messages us and refers to Eve as our mother. We're playing as Sarah, Eve's illegitimate daughter. We were going to call her Sarah. Sam wanted to call her Ava after his nana, but I didn't want her to have a symmetrical name. The name signifies our individuality, and the non-linear format of the game helps realize the distinct perspective we possess. Unlike an open world game where you pause the story until you're ready to move forward, her story lets you start from any point in the narrative and worm your way through from there. The big plot points twisting your understanding of the story will therein be personal to your playthrough. It also serves as a bit of satire. We're presumably trying to convict Hannah, relying on tropes when possible but we soon find ourselves wrapped into the story's fabric. Ultimately, we're just trying to understand our roots. Her story uses its format to comment on how media can dehumanize and encourage stereotyping. In another lens, think of the rash of police shootings in America. Victims killed without a fair trial are often reduced to just being a criminal. The film Fruitvale Station lets us glimpse into the last living hours of the imperfect Oscar Grant, who an officer murdered while defenseless on the ground. Same with the Roots' concept album, Undone. By beginning the story of a gangbanger when he flatlines and working backwards towards his birth, the narrative humanizes the caricature shown in the media. If we plop ourselves inside Eve's head, we can see no matter what, she walks away with a happy ending. As she says, The baby was what mattered. In Hebrew, the name Sarah means princess. And in her way, she frees you and gets her happy ending. You know, can tell, save the princess. Seems a little demented, right? Well, she was a fan of traditional fairy tales. They were dark and real, bizarre and violent. 
end. I mean, Snow White ends with the queen wearing searing hot metal slippers and dancing until she dies, so it's not too far from the realm of possibilities that this is a happy ending for her. But of course, this is my interpretation of it. When Sam Barlow messages us and asks us if we understand why our mom did what she did, we need to literally type out yes, press enter, and cross the street like Eve after she read her mother's diary. As individuals, the game asks us to come to our own personal understanding of her story. It's our history and part of our story too. It's, it's a pun. Get it? <laughs>